I want to read you something from your about page. Um, I think this is from your informal persona bio. Um, quote: um, I have a passion, a sacred quest to understand everything, and to save the world. I am addicted to, quote unquote, view quakes, insights which dramatically change my worldview. Unquote. Uh, what is something that has dramatically changed your view about something maybe recently? Um. Well. Um, in the last year, I decided to uh, study the sacred, and I came up with what I thought was a plausible understanding of what it is, and that surprised me that I was able to do that, and that uh, you know I have now have a plausible understanding of what seemed to me a pretty difficult to understand thing before. So um, that's something in the last roughly year that I came to understand basically what's going on there. Um, I'm not really clear, actually. So when you say the sacred, are you talking about some religious, uh, like some religious well, a, spiritual? I, I mean, the general phenomena. So, so as you know, religion has declined a lot in the last century or so. But the general phenomena of treating something sacredly has not. <laughs> that is, uh, we treat many things sacredly. And that was a problem for me because I have many of these institution proposals for, for how to change institutions. And often a response is that um, my proposals are messing with sacred things. And they that's an explanation for why people are not interested or, or resistant to my proposals. And so I decided, well, I want to understand this thing. Why? Because it's kind of in my way. <laughs> so uh, I was able to think it through and, and have an understanding. So that's, uh, a, you know, quite a big of a change. I have this big area of, my, of, of human behavior that I had previously just was opaque and, you know, mysterious. And now it makes a lot more sense. Did you come to any kind of, did that help you? Did that help you to come to a resolution or is that still, do you think like a, you have to do a, a lot more work to kind of, um, get to where you want to go to, per se? Well, I understand it now as a, a feature of human behavior that's not going away, and then it's usually present. And so it's something I have to deal with and, and react to and adapt to. That it's, I can't just wish it away or wave it away or you know, push it aside. It's there and it's real, and I have to deal with it. So that is... You know, I have some ways to think about now how to deal with it and what it is, but it's uh, it's real and it's there and um, it's part of my world now. Would you say uh, would you say you're religious or? No, I, I mean I'm not, but that's the point: is that uh, the concept of the sacred is much broader than the concept of religion. Uh, that is, the concept of religion, in some sense, recruited the sacred and sort of decided to take it over. In a religious world, um, religion tells you all the things that are sacred and how you should be treating them. So religion is claimed to be some unifying framework to uh, help you adjudicate disputes among sacred things and decide which things should be how treated how sacredly. Religion declares itself to be that sort of an authority. And when you accept religion, then the world of the sacred is organized for you and ordered. Um, and you have authorities who uh, will answer key questions about it. But in the absence of religion, it's still there. And we still treat things as sacred, but now we don't have as unified an approach to it. That is, now we have different sacred things that fight each other, and we don't have an authority to go to to tell us which one is more sacred. So, um, I don't know where I came across this, but... Um, um... The fact that religion has been around for, I think, more than, um, let's say, 2,000 years uh, could be also the reason why it may last for 2,000 years more. Um, do you think that, you know, we will have religion, I don't know, in, even in the next 100 years? Are you optimistic? Well, the question is understanding the great decline we've seen in the last century. So a century ago, you would have easily expected it to continue very long into the future because <laughs> it had lasted for so long. Uh, now, seeing this great decline, the question is, well, how do you understand that decline and, and use that to predict the future? So something so I'm about this decline. I, I, I'm so sorry. So uh, I just want to push back a little bit in the sense that uh, I, I understand you're saying the great decline, but uh, has it, I mean, 
the way I'm looking at this, or the way I'm thinking about it, is there are still billions of people who still follow religion and uh, right. adhere to it religiously. So it's, it's still big, yes. Yeah, but but I mean that's the main reason to pause. Otherwise, you the obvious answer would be yes, it's lasted a long time, so it'll probably last a long time more. That that would be the obvious answer. And then the the only reason to pause is seeing this decline and wondering where that's going. I'm trying to understand it. Where do you think it's going? Um, I've tried to make sense of it in terms of a larger set of other trends. So my, my general intellectual strategy is to try to collect puzzles together into bundles of puzzles and explain them all together at once, rather than try to explain each puzzle one at a time ad hoc. That, I think that's dangerous. I think it's too easy to come up with explanations for things one at a time. And it's more challenging to explain a bunch of things together at once, which means if you can just find something that explains a bunch of things together at once, then you should rely on that more. So um, one, one framework, you know, a simple framework people have is that, um, you know, wealth uh, takes away one of the main reasons for religion, which is, you know, religion is there to comfort you and, and help steal you in times of great difficulty and stress and, and conflict. And as you get rich and comfortable, you don't see the need for that so much anymore. It's as you don't have such times of stress and conflict uh, where you, you are you know, at your wits end and need something to grab onto to, uh, to stabilize you and feel like you, you, you know, can make it through. Um, so that, that makes some sense. Um, but um, I have this simple story of humans were initially foragers for a million years or something, living in small forager groups. And then we had this very wrenching transition to becoming farmers, say roughly 20, 10,000 years ago. And as farmers, we had to live a very different lifestyle with very different values and priorities and culture. And it was actually a wrenching transition to turn foragers into farmers. They didn't like it a lot. Uh, and foragers is the more natural condition for us. That is, we that's where we evolved as a species, and and the you know our, our innate behaviors, intuitive behaviors, were just more naturally what makes sense in a forager world. And farming was only possible because we had strong culture, cultural plasticity, such that culture could tell us a new set of things to do and and what was valuable, and we would go along with that. But it still the farming style wasn't as natural. It required more cultural pressure to get us to be farmers when we were somewhat more naturally foragers. And that succeeded though, the transition happened. And so for 10,000 years, we were farmers. And part of the pressure that made us into farmers was a threat mediated by poverty. That is, um, so in a farming world, a young girl is told that if she has a child out of wedlock, she and her child may starve. And that's a credible threat. And she's poor enough that she might starve. And that's a substantial reason why she is encouraged to not have children out of wedlock as a farming young woman. Whereas foragers were actually much more promiscuous and they didn't really have marriage. and they change their partners every few years. And so, you know, that's more natural, but poverty, the fear and threats that poverty allows are part of what made foragers into farmers. And so the story goes in the last few centuries, we've been getting rich. And as we get rich, these threats that turn foragers into farmers have been weakening and becoming less credible. And so we've been drifting back to forager attitudes and styles in the last few centuries as we get rich. So that's my simple story. So that is then we're going to explain a whole bunch of trends. It's the idea, not just religion. So it'll explain increasing leisure. Uh, it'll explain increasing travel, increasing art, variety. It'll explain increasing democracy, less war, less religion, lower fertility less slavery, um, just a lot of trends can be understood as becoming more forager-like as we get rich. Now, 
work is an exception in this story because in the industrial era at work, we are actually more regimented and dominated than even farmers are in their typical work life. So we are not at all like foragers in our work life. And so we're somewhat schizoid in the sense that we're kind of hyper farmers in the workplace, but once we leave work, we are more forager like, and that's been a trend over the last few centuries. And it's a trend that then can explain a bunch of trends in the last few centuries and religion might be one of those. Um, religion is again, enforced in part by poverty and threats, which aren't as persuasive or compelling when you're rich and comfortable. Um, so, but we still have the sacred, uh, the, the sacred inclination isn't so much something about being poor. It's more of a natural thing that even foragers would have. Foragers had spirituality, just not religion. This is another quote from your, um, about page itself. Um, I have little patience with those whose thinking is sloppy, small or devoid of abstraction. I love to talk to people one-on-one -on -one and common beliefs are not important for friendship. Instead, I value honesty and passion. My family disagrees with me often. I don't take criticism personally. So please don't pull your punches. Close quote. Um, can you describe like this kind of thinking, what it's kind of um, impact it's had on your personal relationships um, with the way you kind of, uh, you know, think about these things? Um, well, I, I like the way I said it then, so I'm not sure if I can say it better now. Um, there's this concept of decoupling that's uh, a thing in the web in the last 10 years or something, which is some people have a style of talking where um, when they hear you say something, they draw lots of inferences about what else you must believe or mean or your other priorities or allegiances. And then they, you know, hit you hard if they think your what you've said is hinting at, um, you know, deviating from their allegiances or their um, you know, alliances, uh, their ideologies. Um, whereas a decoupler is someone who is more able to take literally what someone says and discuss it and evaluate it without drawing all these other conclusions about what side they're on or, you know, what other allegiances they have. So I am clearly more of a decoupler in that sense. Um, that is, I, I want to look at a topic we're arguing about and have our priority be to figure it out and to draw whatever conclusions are there in, in which may differ from whatever we initially started at. And I want us to bring to bear all potential arguments and analysis tools without worrying about offending each other or about being on the wrong side of some political axis or threatening somebody's livelihood or whatever else it is. That is why, you know, I'd like to just analyze the subject. And that's apparently pretty rare, actually. <laughs> that's that's not that common an in intellectual style. Uh, yeah, I mean, in the sense that I think I find myself doing that often in a sense. I don't decouple, I think so. Like if somebody tells me that, uh, let's say, um, um, let's say they support homosexual rights, uh, you know, or gay rights, I naturally assume, you know, they must also not support the capital punishment. Uh, I'm uh, like, I would assume that they're against the capital punishment or, um, you know, um, they are generally very liberal in terms of their social, like social rights per se, they, they must be very liberal. Uh, so I draw a certain, I draw a number of conclusions based on, let's say one, uh, evident, like one point of whatever they might uh, talk about. But also I've noticed that generally it might be true as well. You know, sometimes people generally do tick like multiple boxes. Um, so is that like a fair shortcut that we can take or do you think it'll come back to, you're saying it, it can come back to bite us, is it? I think it's more the problem that when you um, draw negative conclusions and then censure on the basis of that. So if you merely guess that some, one opinion tends to predict the other, that's not really a problem unless you are deciding that that next opinion is, is a terrible evil thing. And you're going to now, you know, just no longer associate with this person or denounce them in public or things like that. Uh, that's more the issue. Uh, I, 
I think it's fine to have lots of weak guesses, bases for guesses on all sorts of things, but then you check. <laughs> that is, um, you can do both, right? In conversation, obviously, you know, conversation requires that we make a lot of guesses about what the other person means and, and is thinking. We just can't mechanically check everything. It's just too much trouble. All, all There's a vast space of possibilities, what they could have in mind, what they might mean. We, we can't mechanically really just check all those things. So we have to be making a lot of guesses, but the idea would be to, to be watching with checks to see if our guesses are right and allow them to tell us no, they're wrong. And so uh, that's more the issue here. Uh, the, the problem is usually that people, if they think you have the wrong beliefs, they get offended and then they fight you or they denounce you. Th those are the things that move you out of the space of just trying to analyze the question. So it's not the fact that you draw, make guesses about what people might mean from some things to others. That's, you know, you can't avoid that, but um, still check. And if they contradict your guesses, accept that and, you know, find out what they actually think. So, so this decoupling, um, do you use it regularly on a one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one conversation as well? Like, do you use that a yes, lot? Yes, of course. Yeah. Yes. But you that also, is... right. But you, you kind of alluded to this, but so doesn't it get tedious for you? Like, I mean, tedious for you and also about the conversation itself? So to, to me, the key thing here is an orientation of the conversation in terms of there's some claims at issue and we're trying to figure out what's true. And in order to do that, we need to make a bunch of conversational moves that make sense in terms of that, like clarify terms, collect arguments on one side or the other, collect evidence, collect, you know, see what the consensus belief in various expert communities in, things like that. And then, you know, try to note dependencies and track, you know, if this depends on that, then what, what do we think about that, et cetera. But it's about the orientation toward a truth-seeking conversation using the usual sorts of conversational moves that make sense in that sort of conversation. Um, most conversations aren't like that. <laughs> that is most conversations, people aren't, you know, just primarily trying to figure out what's true and to analyze some question. They have other priorities in the conversation, including figuring out how much of an ally you are and whether you're on their side and reassuring each other and, you know, flattering each other and, you know, things like that. And th that's the, that's more the point here. If, you, if you're thinking in those other terms and when you hear somebody say something, then you're drawing conclusions about those other things. You know, if you say something about, you know, um, sorry, um, capital punishment, I might then conclude you're an enemy of me, mine, and then fight you about it or something because I'm mainly looking to see who's on my side and who's not and have fights or things like that. And I'm not trying to figure out something. So that, that's what I mean is that, is that I, I was trying in that passage to signal that I'm, I want to have a conversation where we figure things out together. So uh, when you are trying to figure out certain things with uh, certain people, um, how often is it that it turns into like an argument or have you kind of figured out a way where um, you're able to kind of convey your points and not get into an argument per se? I don't know. Does that happen? So what is it? I mean, the question is what you mean by an argument there. So I, I think what you mean is seeing some sort of emotion or, or like um, frustration even, or aggression or, um, you know, some sort of an agenda. And honestly, I'm, I'm willing to tolerate a fair bit of those things as long as you'll still play the, the, the make the argument moves, the conversation moves that would make sense if we were trying to figure things out together. I don't need you to, to pretend that you are entirely emotionally neutral about everything, but I'm expecting you to keep it enough under control that we can still do the conversation thing. That is still, you know, make distinctions, you know, distinguish the options, analyze for each one, what, what it would take for that to be true. Ask what, well, you know, what, what evidence do we have to contradict any of them? You know, just to walk through in detail the dependencies in order to figure things out. That's the main thing I'm looking for. Um, I don't need your emotional stance 
to be, you know, fully calm neutral or something. Have you seen any correlation between uh, how passionate they are or, you know, how emotional they get uh, with respect to like with their arguments? I mean, have you seen any correlation in that way? I mean, th- there's just a basic fact that if you aren't, if you don't have some level of emotional involvement, you aren't going to care and you're not going to bother to put in any effort, right? <laughs> that is, so, so the ideal is where you are, you care enough and you're motivated to be willing to put in energy, but you still are keeping it managed so that you aren't, you know, flying off the handle. So can I push back on that? So in the sense that uh, I'm thinking of uh, Noam Chomsky, uh, like whenever I've heard Noam Chomsky talk, I feel like, uh, like he, it's very um, painful to hear too. Like, I mean, I, I, he makes excellent points, but uh, I feel he's very monotonous and uh, not, I mean, if you, if you listen to him on the radio, you would feel that he's not very like, uh, you know, enthu about it or, you know, he's uh, not very aggressive or not very, doesn't show a lot of emotion, but make extremely good points. Uh, so how do you kind of uh, look at that? Well, I would say, you know, first of all, just people vary a lot in their personalities and their styles. And then conversations vary a lot. And intellectual conversations are just one subset of a wide range of conversations. And then when people find a way to be good at intellectual conversations, they find a lot of different ways to do that. There's a lot of different personality styles and emotional styles and tone of voice styles that work. So... I'm, you know, again, I, I'm happy exactly with somebody like Chomsky. If they can find a way to make good arguments and be good at the intellectual part of it, I'm not going to complain much about their affect or their tone or their pacing or other sorts of things. I'm going to just, you know, accept a wide range of those things. And, you know, that's exactly what you see with someone like him. What you actually do see is that the people who are really good at this, they do have a pretty wide range of these styles which just suggests it's just hard to do. <laughs> and the more you try to constrain other things, the harder it is to get that. So it's, it's this optimization thing. Like if you try to optimize for both X and Y, it's you won't get something good at X as if you just optimize for X, right? So if people are just trying to get the argument right and they're not like tr- focusing a lot of energy on trying to manage their emotional stance or their tone or things like that, they're more likely to, to get the argument right. So one digression, which is, uh, I feel like, um, but if you convey or if you put, if you convey a lot of emotion, I think generally um, it helps, quote unquote, sell the debate or sell the talk very well. No, like I'm thinking of like Jordan Peterson, where I feel like, you know, he's very, uh, what is that? He's very expressive and uh, right. very emotive. And people send, uh, even if they don't understand the points or even if they don't care about the argument, they are very, just as an entertainment factor, I think they're very sold on to. Right. So that's, again, the point Like most conversations, even things that look intellectual, aren't actually that intellectual, right? So in a, in a presentation like that, he's having an effect on the audience and the audience wanted that effect. And that effect isn't mainly through the arguments. And that's most conversations. <laughs> even most conversations on intellectual topics aren't intellectual conversations in the sense of the two parties working together to figure things out. Most conversations on intellectual topics are people inspiring other people, impressing other people, et cetera, through talking about them, but not actually working together with them in the conversation. So that's why you see that wide range. And yes, once your goal in the conversation isn't to figure something out together, then you're going to, and your goal is to say, impress, inspire your audience, get them affiliated with you, get them to pay money for your talks, whatever it is, then you're going to. If you're successful at that, you're going to be drawing on a wide range of tools for doing that. And those tools will include emotion, certainly. But, you know, part sometimes there are these norms where certain kinds of emotions are taboo. And so people will avoid them just because they're taboo in some contexts. Can you give me an example? Uh, I didn't understand. Well, so, so many intellectuals, even if they're emotional about the topic, the norm is to keep a certain sort of emotional, you know, tone that's that's more that doesn't, isn't as expressive as just, it's a style preference. It has some advantages, but still people can, you know, there can be contexts where there's certain kinds of emo- there's a certain kind of emotional affect that's expected. And then people will present that affect because that's the one expected in that context. Are you happy with the way, uh, like you present your ideas? Like, I think you have, you give a lot of talks and, uh, you know, uh, I think you have given a lot of media presentations as well. Um, are you happy with the way you like you do your talks and with the way you've been able to inspire your ideas to people or 
how do you evaluate yourself? So I think of myself as someone who's mainly invested all along in trying to figure out what's true. And not so much in impressing people or even inspiring them or, you know, and so that comes at that cost. So like most people who are somewhat famous intellectuals or something, they have put a fair bit of investment into not just figuring out what's true, but impressing their audience using big words, citing stuff, you know, knowing things other people don't know and inspiring them with allegiance, i.e., being passionate and showing, you know, in, you know, using all the tricks of rhetoric to, to get people's attention and to get them on your side. Um, that is most intellectuals who have, you know, a fair audience or whatever have invested in a lot of things other than just figuring out what's true because their audiences reward them for that. Um, I feel like compared to the person who is similarly successful to me or something, I have just been focusing more on figuring out what's true and I've not been focusing as much on impressing you with my credentials or how difficult it was to do what I did or the big words that I used to express it or the allies I can bring to bear who will, who will back me up and be support my position or the reasons why you should be along with me because you and I are on the same team or my eloquence with putting words together that ring to and make an entertaining presentation. I just feel like I'm not investing so much in all those other things. And, you know, I have to accept losing out because of that. I'm more investing in just figuring out what's true on interesting topics. And so my game is I'm going to compensate for those other lacks by just continuing focusing on interesting topics and making interesting, you know, insights into them. And then somebody will be interested in what I say because of that. So my, the form of my arguments are usually just, some sort of, you know, most concise, simplest presentation of, you know, my claim and the reasons why you should believe it. And I usually don't do all the other stuff that other people do to win their audiences over. I don't cite lots of authority. I don't like, you know, quote famous literature. I don't, you know, subtly tell them I'm on the same side politically as them. Uh, all those other sorts of things that other people successfully do. Uh, and it's just a matter of you can't invest in everything. You have to pick something to invest in. And so this is what I pick. Um, so um, I think this is a good segue for something I'm going to read to you again. Um, so, quote, uh, my best idea is Idea Futures, a radical alternative to existing academic institutions. But I felt that without contacts or credentials, I wasn't getting very far. So I returned to school at great expense to get those contacts and credentials. Close quote. Uh, so here you talk about, uh, you know, not having the right contacts and not having the right credentials uh, and then going making that decision to go back to school. Um, I think previously you, you kind of alluded that, you know, you don't kind of um, show your credentials per se or, you know, you're not uh, you're not uh, going, you're not displaying authority or, you know, you're reaching to authority per se. Um, I'm just trying to connect those two things in the sense that um, how important is like, uh, you know, um, getting these credentials, getting those contacts uh, in terms of being heard or in terms of your arguments being heard and being taken right. seriously? Like, how do you kind of think about that? So I think about it as sort of edginess or how much can I get away with? So initially, I just studied things on my own for my own benefit to figure things out with no, no attention to compromise credentials or contacts or whatever. I just, you know, went to the library and read stuff and figured stuff out. And then I realized that, you know, if I continue with that plan, my life would be my having this job and me figuring a bunch of stuff out, but nobody would ever hear or, or take it seriously. So then I decided I needed to compromise with the usual way of doing things. That is, I needed to go get a PhD and I needed to, you know, pub publish to get a PhD and then publish to get tenure. And I needed to do what it took to get some level of um, affiliation and credential for two purposes. One is so that I could get time, more time to spend on things rather than like, just doing things on the side as a, you know, with an, another full-time job. And the other is to have credentials, i.e. to have reasons why people might listen to me. 
because of, you know, things I had done and things, people who had vouched for me in essence. Um, so that's why I chose to go back to school. And then I chose in say my PhD, I did some things that I thought were just interesting, but other things I thought, well, these are the things that you need to do to get PhD and then to get a job. And so once I had a PhD, I got a tenure track job after a postdoc. And then I did the things that were necessary to try to get tenure. But I was always on the edge of allowing myself to do other stuff that I thought was interesting, even though I was doing the stuff that I needed to do to get credential. And then at some point, I somewhat luckily succeeded. I think I probably pushed too far in the sense I was taking too big a risks of doing what I thought was interesting rather than what needed to be done to impress people and get credentials. But luckily, at least I got tenure. And once you have tenure as a professor, the trade-offs are very different now. That is, you have this credential, you have all this time, and there isn't much you can do to lose that. So there's not much cost to really taking a lot bigger risks with your research topics once you have tenure. Um, that is, you, you can just study whatever you want mostly. And so I've taken that freedom much more once I had tenure. But if I didn't have tenure, if I wasn't a professor and I was just writing stuff, it would be much harder to get anybody to listen. And I still may have made a mistake of not going far enough for credentials and impressiveness in my life since tenure. Uh, I made a you know choice there, but there's a trade-off there. You know, on the one extreme, if you just do exactly what you want in the exactly the style you want, and you don't make any attempts to impress people or get contacts or credentials, then you'll just be going on the good graces of readers who might read you and like you and recommend you to other people. That's actually a pretty weak system in the world. It doesn't work that well. The other extreme is you just do the things that people are at the, the, you know, the officials around you want, the journals want, the funders want, the things like that. You do the things that would impress them that they are rewarding and you ignore entirely what you think is interesting. That's the two extremes of the process and the choices where to be in the middle. Uh, so I think, <clears throat> I think this is a bad example for me, but uh, anyways, um, in terms of, if I think about uh, the path that, uh, at least to my knowledge, uh, Elisir Yudkowsky has taken, do you think that he would be taken more seriously or his arguments would have been taken more seriously if he was coming from, let's say, a university affiliation or with the way, or with the path that you had taken, you know, maybe, uh, uh, you know, getting a tenure track positions uh, in, a, in a university and then, uh, you know, do you think that would have accelerated the arguments that he was making or am I making sense here? I don't know. At least the point that I'm trying to convey. So in the last few decades, at least a different route to success has been sometimes to get some rich patron to be impressed by you and fund your work. So that's the route he took successfully. There aren't as many slots for that in the world. <laughs> that is, most rich patrons give money to universities and to major institutions. And so if you're going to get their money, you get it indirectly through those institutions. But some of those people have, um, you know, directly given to people. But in order to get money that route, you have to be in their world. It's not enough to just do something interesting. You have to show up at the parties they show up or things like that. So that's never, that hasn't really been an option for me. I've never been enough invited to the sort of parties where those rich people would go to <laughs> that I would get them to give me money. So some people succeed at that and I'm not entirely clear to me how, but clearly one of the factors is just to be in their world. That is, you not only have to be at the sort of parties they go to, you have to like, people in that world have to talk about you and then they have to hear other people talk about you and they want to get a sense that other people in this world, the people they respect, respect you. And then they might give you resources to do things. Um, but even then they can give you money, but still when you do things, it'll be still harder to get this larger world to listen because you're not connected as well to that larger world of credentials and, and you know, credibility. So that's a, that's a key trade-off. Um, 
it's it's related, interestingly, to um, why why can't we make jobs competitive with college? So, what do you mean? As you may know, the main way in society that people uh, you know become qualified for high level jobs is by going to college and getting a college degree. Even though we mostly know that you don't learn very much in college. So you might think, well, you would do better than to get an internship or a job at some good place and work for four years and then get a recommendation based on that. And that would be a superior career path to going to college. The problem with that, though, is that colleges have coordinated to create, to create comparable evaluations. If you get a you know, B plus average and in civil engineering at the University of Cincinnati, people think they know what that means in comparison with other people. But if you go to, I don't know, Google and get a, do a job there for four years, and then you get a letter of recommendation from your boss that has a text of page, people don't know how to compare that. They don't know how to slot it. It's not been made comparable. It's not been standardized. And so the reason why people go to college instead of getting jobs is the lack of that standardization of the job evaluation. You could do the job, you could do a good job, but the thing you get at the end isn't evaluatable or comparable by other people to other people. That's why they go to college. So a similar thing happens for doing research. If you get a PhD in a standard academic program and then publish in standard academic journals, then when you go to other people and try to tell them that they should be impressed and listen to you, they, people think they know what that means. They know how to compare you to other people. If you got some rich guy to fund your work and it hasn't been vetted by the usual authorities and disciplines, all they know is like some people are talking about you. The problem is they just don't know as well how to compare you, how to evaluate you. Um, and that's going to be a disadvantage. It, doesn't mean it's an overwhelming disadvantage, but it is a disadvantage. So anytime you'd have a non-standard career path, one of the risks is people will look at what you did and go, I guess that's impressive, but I don't know. I don't know how to compare this thing you did. And that people go to a standard career path. A thing is they know what that means. They think they know at least how to compare that. So both for career paths or for research paths, that's one of the big pressures that make people do things the usual way is that, you know, you, you, people think they know what it means to do things the usual way and how to rate that. And there's a sense in which their evaluation of you can't fall too far below some threshold of, you know, whatever goes along with that thing you've done. Whereas if you do something weird, they just don't know. And so that's a problem because some kinds of research you see, um, even if they're insightful, they look like they might have been easy. So a lot of academic research in terms of journals, the main thing they're doing is they're showing you that it was hard work to do what they did. Even if the results aren't very important, they're very, they very clearly convince you not everybody could do this thing I did. And then you might have an insight into, say, the, like the sacred like I was telling you about, and it might be a very deep, important insight but it looks really simple. And somebody goes, how do I know you couldn't have just done that in the afternoon? <laughs> they don't know how hard it is. And therefore they don't know how to compare it to other things other people do. And therefore how much to credit you for what you've done. So that's why academia mostly focuses on showing you that what they did was hard. <laughs> and they don't actually focus very much on showing you that it's important. And this, so. Uh... Is it fair to say that this um, desire for more and more credentials and, uh, um, you know, not the ability to fit in, but uh, the desire to get credentials per se, do you think that's increased over the years since, you know, you went back to school or um, is there is there any pushback? I mean, it just looks like it's gone up over centuries. I don't know if, if it's more in the last few decades but it's definitely been going up over centuries. So I would just expect it also continued over the last few decades. And, you know, it's a problem in many ways, I think. Um, 
you know, I might wish, say, college students or college level students would, you know, do what they need to show that they're competent at college, but then take, I don't know, a third of their time and just excel, try to excel at something like make something creative, novel, original, do an interesting thing and like show what you can do with that. That, that would seem to me more interesting as a pool of people to pick from rather than the people who just like, you know, go to harder classes or try to get two or three majors. <laughs> and what they basically try to do is do more of the standard things, but not really take much initiative or think much for themselves. And that's a problem. I, I mean, you can see why they fear the risk that if they spent a big chunk of the time on some original project of their own, then they wouldn't be getting as many majors or as high a GPA or whatever, or as good a college. And they would risk somebody looks at it and going, I don't know how to evaluate this. Is this impressive or not? How, how do I tell that? That's the fear they have is that even if you did something great, people couldn't tell. I'm just sorry, but in this example, you're kind of making the assumption that doing original work is more is better than doing the work that's assigned, but much better, right? Right. I'm, I'm, I think that there's this key difference between school and even research or life, which is school, they give you a bunch of assignments. And then you know from the fact the assignment was given to you that it's doable. And you know from the way the assignment was given you what kind of space of things near it you should be looking at. And so you don't really develop the skill of figuring out in more generally what you should do because you're mostly told at the broader level what to do and you're just more filling in the details. So if we want people in the world to also figure out what to do, they need to practice that. They need to, to spend time doing it. That's the only way they're going to learn to do that. And so they should start earlier in life doing that. Uh, the, the longer they wait to sort of take charge of their life and just figure out from a very basic level what to do, the worse they're going to be at it, the less practice and the less the worst products we'll have from all that. Uh, you know, in research, you know, there are, once you have a research project, there are some tasks you can assign people and then they can do those tasks and fill that in. But the, the basics of the research project is which project to do in the first place, which sort of method, you know, at what time and what ways. I mean, there's the basic big questions drive most of variation and productivity. Like which project did you do? Which style did you do it in? Things like that. And in order to get good at that, you just have to practice. You have to own things basically <laughs> right from the beginning you have to decide okay which things should be done which questions should be asked which which data should be investigated which theoretical tools should be applied that's where most of the variation and success comes from is from those basic questions and so to get people who are going to do that well they just have to start practicing from an early point I... do you think uh, research has some similarities with like the way uh, sports work in the sense that the way i'm thinking about this is uh, where the where the peaks in performance come at a very early like a earlier age i'm thinking like i don't know mid 20s or you know early 30s uh, and by i don't know by, by mid 30s like generally i think i feel like sports careers are generally over um do you do you see similar do you see similarities of that age dynamics where you do your amazing the most amazing work when you're young or um, how do there, you there's a literature on this. So, um, uh, you know, part of the literature is about, so they say that like conceptual breakthrough work tends to be done earlier and then sort of just high intensity work it does is done or peaks earlier, but work that just builds up, builds over a lifetime of accumulation that peaks later. So, um, you know, so in sports, like there's just a sense in which you, you just have to push your body at a, at a certain level of intensity. And then if your body just can't handle that later, then you just can't do that so much later. Um, but, you know, in say a business person or something, if, if six, being making good successful business choices depends on this, how many things you've seen in your life and how many things you've heard and all the different things you can pull together, then you just get better over time. Uh, even if you know, maybe you don't get it. You can't put as many hours a day or a week into it. You, the hours you do put in, you're more productive because you, you're building on a bigger base. So 
I think of polymaths as more that sort of skill in, in intellectual world. So if your intellectual strategy is going to be to learn many different areas and look for intersections or combinations of them, then the more different things you've seen, the more successful you can be at like finding those combinations. And that, that will peak later in life. With that in context, um, so I think if I'm not wrong, you're 63 years old. Um, do you think your best work is ahead of you or do you think you've already done your best work? So I recall a study that asked at what age do people do their best work for academics? And it was basically pretty uniformly across their life. So it seemed like every year you just have another lottery ticket for doing your best work. And, you know, the lottery chance hasn't changed that much. So that means it's just about how many years you keep going, right? <laughs> Even if you've done whatever you've done so far, every year you've got another chance to do better. So if you, if you worked for, you know, 30 years so far and you do another year, well, in this next year, you've got a 3% chance of doing better than anything you've done so far, right? But it's, it's, um, so it seems like if you're more than halfway through, then more likely you've already done your best thing, you know, more likely than not, because every year it gives you an equal chance, but still you shouldn't quit because every year you get another shot. Do you see yourself, I mean, um, do you see yourself ever retiring from like the things that you do, like do you, do you have a number where, you know, once you hit, I don't know, 70, 75, where you're like, no, I'm just going to spend more time with my family or, you know, just uh, um, do some other things. I'm not going to focus on ideas per se. I mean, I'm not inclined at the moment, but if I look at older people, I what I think I see is just a weariness. It looks like one of the things that happens to you when you get rather old is you're worn down and you can't do as many things. So, you know, one approach would be to just, as you get older, you just spend fewer hours a day doing it, but you still keep doing it. Another approach might be you just quit at some point because the, you know, even doing a little bit is stressful or something. So I, I think it might depend you know, on sort of how, how relaxed you are, how, how, how fulfilling it is versus stressful it is. So I think if you can find a thing that's just pretty much fulfilling, like it just immerses you in, you're interested and you're doing it and you can just keep doing it even as you slow down, then I think those sort of people just keep doing it until they die. Um, for people for whom like they have to juggle a bunch of balls, say as a lab head, or they have to write reports and, and grant proposals and oversee things. And there's just a big pile of stuff they have to do as a unit. Then at some point they just want to quit on that because they just can't handle all of that and it's stressful and they just need to drop. And if, if that's the main thing they do, they might just not do anything because that was their main thing. Cert certainly another issue seems to be sort of what we call crystallized versus, um, you know, fluid intelligence. People young early on are more flexible and older people are less flexible and that can happen intellectually. Um, so you might just be less flexible when you're older and less able to go into a new area and try a new thing, but you could still do an old thing and, and do it well. And that's probably just something you have to accept. <laughs> less jump into new things and continue to do old things, you know, when, when you, you're older, but I seem to be jumping into new things myself a lot lately. So, um, that doesn't seem to be a problem for me. In fact, like I... I started this podcast with a philosopher called Minds Almost Meeting, and that was an exercise in trying to stretch myself in the sense that she thinks about things very different than I do, has a whole different disciplinary background, and that's an attempt to be more flexible, to, to try to engage and understand a wider set of perspectives about how to, do, how to think about things. And I think, I mean, maybe she'd disagree, but I think I'm like successfully getting a little more flexible and broad in that process. I want to read you something from uh, Brian Kaplan. Um, 
Quote, um, when the typical economist tells me about his latest research, my standard reaction is, A, maybe. Then I forget about it. When Robin Hansen tells me about his re- latest research, my standard, rea- my standard reaction is, no way, impossible. Then I think about it for years. Close quote. How do you decide what to work on? Um, so I think of the strategies I've settled as pretty straightforwardly explainable obvious strategies, even if not that many other people take them. So I'd say fundamentally what you're looking for is an important topic. You're looking for it to be neglected to some degree, i.e. other people are not, you know, throwing themselves at it to the degree it's important. And then you're looking at for an angle, like some angle at which you could approach the topic, some tool or you know, a neglected tool or a neglected relevant piece of datum or something that you can use to, to, to pick, to get at it. Um, you know, something can be important, neglected, but if you just don't have some way to get at it, then now you could start out the topic and just explore and look for a way to get at it. And you could just spend some time looking for an angle, but then if you just don't find one, you should back off, I guess, because you're not going to make progress without an angle of some sort. So an angle is some analogy with something else or some theoretical framework or some datum that other people seem to be not fully exploiting. That would, that's how it's neglected. So the topic is not just neglected. There's some angle that's neglected, something you could do. And that's what it takes, basically. Important, neglected, and you, you have an angle. Um, now on, so a, a, many of my topics are like puzzle questions, like w- what's going on here? How does this work? And for that, I have a, like, I think I described to you before, the general method is collect a bunch of puzzles, a bunch of datums, and then collect a bunch of theories and then do match. <laughs> Ask which of the theories bets matches, you know, more of the puzzles. And this is a very simple method. It's relatively qualitative and I still think it still seems to be neglected. And my guess is it's neglected because it's not impressive enough. People would rather pick some impressive, difficult tool and use that as their way to study something in order to impress people. And the simple collect the puzzles, collect the theories and do matches doesn't actually require that much in the way of complicated techniques or tools. That's why it's powerful, I think, but I think that's also why it's neglected. When do you decide to stop working on something? I mean, like you will have multiple puzzles or multiple ideas or multiple research uh, directions. Um, When would you say, let's um, even, even if you take it up at what point do you say, you know, this is not going anywhere or, you know, maybe I'm, I won't pursue this right now. Like when do you drop the ball? Well, so one process is just something else grabs your attention. And you, you know, you often have a lust of things you plan on working on, but you just don't get to many of them because some things take higher priority. So probably most common is that you just stop working on something because it drops in priority and then you forget about it. Basically, you know, it's not being brought to mind and you're not thinking about it. Um, but another thing that can happen is success. Um, you can have a success and then not really see what to do next. You're not clear whether the next thing you could do there is, is nearly as valuable as what you did. So that that's often my situation where I make what I think is substantial progress. And then I ask, well, what, what could I do here next? And and I don't see as much. Most people, you know, like they just stick with some area and they spend their whole life in that area. And so, Whenever they do one thing in that area, they just go on to do a next thing in that area and on and on. And they, they just stick with the area, you know, whether it's rich or not. And I'm more switching areas based on my sense of what looks promising. I think you've have, uh, I think you have plans to, um, get yourself cryogenically frozen. Is it? That's correct. Could you maybe tell us what it is and, uh, your decision to. Could you walk us through your decision to like why you 
ended up doing that? So I got to this is one of the ways in which I am most demonstrably contrarian, yet it seems to me the argument here is very simple and persuasive. So something is just missing here in you know, my ability to communicate with or understand other people. So the idea is, as you know, people die all the time. And when they die, some part of their body ceases to function and therefore the whole body ceases to function. And then your brain doesn't get blood and the, you know, bacteria aren't kept out and they come in and eat your brain. Uh, and then you're gone. Um, so medical technology has been improving over centuries. And so people who in the past would have died or now they don't die. Uh, and they had pretty much the same bodies, but things that in the past we couldn't fix, we can fix now. Um, so that raises the possibility that if you freeze someone now, that is, if you take their brain and you just put it in liquid nitrogen and it, at that point, we're sure it just doesn't change because at low temperature and things just, you know, atoms will just stay where they are. They won't move. That if you just leave them there for centuries, that some future medic te technology could unfreeze them and fix them. That's like an abstract argument, but I have this book called The Age of M, Work, Love, and Life at Robots Rule the Earth about a concept called brain emulation, which is a much more specific technology that could take a frozen brain and bring it back to a new life as a computer simulation of that brain. And that scenario doesn't require that the, you know, that allows for a lot of damage in the freezing process, whatever else led you to do that. So if you take a person today and their body is breaking somehow, failing, you freeze them in liquid nitrogen. And then that process of freezing will do some damage in addition to whatever problems they had before. After the freezing, it will just be constant with time. And then the idea is you can do a brain scan of that frozen brain later, figure out which cells are well connected, what of which type. And then if you have good enough models of how each brain cell type does input output signal mapping, you could make a computer simulation of that whole brain. That's not something we can do now, but plausibly it will be something we can do in the next few centuries. So the idea is if you are now at the point where medical science might give up on you, you could at a modest cost be frozen and then kept in liquid nitrogen for centuries perhaps, at which point later on when they know how to do brain emulation, they take your frozen brain and they emulate it. And then you wake up and there you are as a brain emulation in this new world. So the idea is that unless civilization collapses and is never able to do brain emulation or the organization that freezes you fails and lets you thaw, then this looks like a pretty reliable way to not dying. And once you are a brain emulation in this new world, you could have an indefinite life uh, if you have sufficient resources to continue. So this is a path to not dying. In our world, this path has existed since the 1960s, uh, 60 years then, and people have heard about it through free international publicity because people find this fascinating. And there are news articles on it periodically <laughs> over the decades. And yet at the moment, only roughly 3000 people have signed up for this and only 300 people have been frozen. And that's why the costs are relatively high, but they're still affordable to be frozen. So I am a customer of this and this thing around my neck says that, you know, if you find me in a medical state, this is, you should call these people so they can arrange for this process. Um, so the puzzle here is I got to say, this seems like a plausible argument. So the cost to do this is comparable to the cost of having your ashes thrown into space. There are a similar number of people who do, in fact, have their ashes thrown into space. And that seems to me a lot less benefit of having your ashes thrown into space than into, you know, actually maybe coming back. The people who spouse, spouses of people who have their ashes thrown into space, that doesn't bother them very much. But spouses of people who are frozen, it bothers them a lot. And uh, divorce is often a consequence of people choosing to be frozen because it really bothers other people that you plan to do this, which they think is weird. 
ashes thrown into space is apparently not seen as so weird. And I think the key difference is nobody believes that you believe that you will come back ashes thrown into space, but they do think you believe you might come back if you're frozen. And that's the thing that bothers them. The fact that you believe it might work. And that's weird. And so this, I think is, you know, it's, it's a shame in some sense that like most people don't have to die. <laughs> that is if, if millions of people would do this, the cost would come way down, the reliability would go way up and then they would mostly all live because they aren't choosing there are most everybody in the world is dying and they don't have to. And this argument is pretty simple and straightforward. And most people you present the argument to, they nod and they go, it makes some sense, but almost nobody does this. Almost nobody, by, I mean, only 3000 people have ever signed up for this in the entire world over 60 years of this being available. Um, so I have a weird question here in the sense that, uh, you would also want your family members also to kind of sign up for this, no? Or else, in the sense that... You would, of course, yes. Okay. So that convince you have to convince them, is it? Like, I mean... So, of course, you would want your family to come along. That would be a benefit. If people you know are there coming back with you, that you'd be a more attractive world to come back to and they could help you and you could help them. So, yes, of course, you would want your family member to come on. But the problem is it's hard to convince family members to come along because this is weird and they'd rather think not <laughs> they'd rather just not deal with the fact that it's weird and they don't want to be weird by association uh it can be secretive as well no i mean it doesn't have to be weird if it's secret no um but you know you might tell people so yes but still but people your spouses don't like you to do weird things even if they don't tell anybody because they you know, you might tell somebody and of course if you're trying to get other people to go along with you you're going to tell them Right, so there's certainly a conflict between trying to get other people to come along with you and then trying to not tell anybody. Do you not get scared of living forever, or I mean, do you see a point? Let's say, let's example, uh, let's. Uh, well, presumably, you know, as long as suicide remains an option, then you don't have to be. You know, some people imagine some sort of a hell where they torture you forever and won't let you die, but it seems a pretty unlikely scenario to me. Why would somebody pay to torture you forever? <laughs> I mean, it costs them, right? I'm more worried that there won't, I won't find a place in this world where I'm valued and can survive by, you know, adding value to the world. Have you thought about, um, have, have you, I mean, this is a little too early, but have you thought about what you're going to do if this was to succeed and, you know, you were to kind of quote unquote live on forever? Are there things that you have already thought about, you know, that you will definitely try out or per se? doesn't seem to me the sort of thing I need to figure out ahead of time. I, I, so if, if I come back as a brain emulation into this world that I've written this book about, then I will have been the guy who wrote the book about the world that I'm coming into. So I will, of course, immediately want to check the world against my book and see how right did I get it. So um, this, is a, this is a weird question, I think, but uh, like... You have written multiple articles. You have written multiple is a, I mean, understatement. Like you've written many articles, uh, but you have only written two books, no? Like I think one is the right. the one is on brain emulation, and I think another one is co-authored with uh, Kevin Summer, right. which is the elephant yes. in the brain. Um, yes. So, like, uh, I thought like you would have written like multiple books. Uh -huh. Like, is there any reason you've only stopped at two? Or so the the trade off is is the degree of focus. I mean, to write a book, you have to focus on one topic for a few years. And I'm just tempted by all these topics. And so I've recently just been tempted to pursue many topics rather than focus on one book. Um, I mean, another issue is I like to write concisely and just write the text necessary to say the thing I want to say. So when I do that on a specific topic like the sacred or grabby aliens, we haven't discussed so much. Um, you know, I write something that says the thing I want to say, and then I'm done. And somebody, most people, when they write books, books have to be longer than those things. And so the question is, how do you fill a whole book? And often people take an article level articles worth of an idea and they pad it into a book. 
and I'm not very fond of that. <laughs> so the challenge is to find a set of related things you want to say that require that much space to say that all have a common theme. You know, otherwise, so I actually, I don't like to, when they pad an article into a book, I think books should only be written for things that need a whole book to say. That's an idea that has a lot of parts, a lot of connected things that all need to be in that book. And in some sense, you know, the world is better if you if your ideas don't need to be in such big chunks, right? That is what you want to make ideas in as small a chunk as possible so that people can evaluate it separately from other things. And that's, that, that means you want small chunks if you can. What's your, what's your favorite book? I don't know that I have one. Um, I, I don't, I'm not really in that mode of having favorite books. It's, it's interesting to notice. I mean, when people have a favorite book, it's kind of like having a favorite movie or something. It's kind of a certain sort of a fandom stance toward the category to have a favorite. There's a bunch of other things you don't have favorites of because you don't think about them in those terms. Like, what's your favorite newspaper article you ever read? Like, what? <laughs> Nobody saves their favorite newspaper article. It wouldn't make much sense to even remember what your favorite article ever was. So why have a favorite book? Um, like, so, um, like, when I think about it... Um... Like the example I can think of is like, let's say Harry Potter, like a lot of people kind of, uh, even though they, uh, they might have read a lot of books, um, they might feel the most, uh, you know, happy or um, most attached to that particular book. And, you know, they might develop certain affiliations and, you know, maybe call that as favorite. Um, but I, maybe I get your point as well. Um, I don't but know. it's part of being a world where people would talk about that sort of thing. That, that's the key point, right? You have many things you like, like what was your favorite tennis shoe you ever wore? Do you, do you have a favorite tennis shoe you ever wore? I mean, does that make sense? What was the favorite fork you ever held? You must have, you've had a lot of forks in your life. What was your favorite fork, right? So you realize most of the things in your life, you know, you, you compare them and you value them, but you don't pick a favorite. Like, so picking a favorite makes a category of things stand out as unusual. It's going to be a category of things where you talk about other people about your favorite. It's going to be a kind of thing you recommend to people a lot, right? and you compare to yourself with other people a lot, that's showing how that category is distinctive. So this is also illustrating sort of my, my key intellectual strategy. I'm taking this topic and I'm finding a puzzle. And by finding a puzzle, I'm then making it a candidate for something I might study more, right? I'm noticing, well, we don't have favorites for most things. We have favorites for a few things. What explains the difference between the few things we have favorites for and the mass majority we don't? I've made it the topic of puzzle, and now it's a candidate for something to study. Because there's a question here. But I would, what I would want to do is collect a bunch of similar puzzles, related puzzles, and then try to address them all together if I could. So that's why I would notice this puzzle and collect it. So I'm a collector of puzzles, you see. I'm going to put this away, squirrel it away as one of my puzzles that maybe I'll find other ones like, and then explain them all together. That's all I have for you. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time. <laughs>